Well, I've been the director for about six weeks, but I gotta tell you, I haven't had any other days like this one. <laughs> What an amazing program, and Merrill Comer is phenomenal to have put this all together, and all the other organizations and individuals that work to make it happen uh, deserve our applause. So maybe right now we should thank them for all the work they did. I'm very excited about the scientific opportunities that lie in front of us, and now standing at the helm of the largest supporter of biomedical research uh, in the United States, I can see those opportunities really in front of us in ways that are breathtaking. Let me just tell you one story about somebody who's lived the leading edge of these developments. Seven years ago, Kate Robbins, who's a nurse, developed a headache and to her dismay and that of her husband, who happened to be the radiologist who read her films, it turned out she had a tumor in her brain. Things got worse a week or two later when it was discovered that actually she had an even larger tumor in her lung, and the brain tumor was a metastasis. All of you know that that kind of circumstance is extremely serious, and few people have long survival after that kind of an answer. Kate who was only in her 40s, had a nine-year-old son, an 11-year-old daughter, and she began to write in her death journal. She tried to write down things that she thought her children might want to know about her final days that they might read at some time in the future. She underwent the standard kinds of aggressive chemotherapy. There seemed to be some partial response, uh, but she felt quite ill during much of that, lost 40 pounds, and began to face up to the fact that things weren't working. But then she heard about a clinical trial of a drug that had just made it through the preclinical phase and was being tried on a few patients. And so she signed up for it. When I talked to her, she said she was a little disappointed because it just looked like a vi vitamin. I mean, isn't treatment supposed to make you feel terrible? And this didn't. And she couldn't imagine that this was doing much for her. But over the course of the next couple of months, it seemed like her disease had stabilized. And then a couple more months, it looked as if her tumors were starting to shrink. A year later, she stopped writing in the death journal. Didn't seem like it was necessary after all. A year after that, she went back to work. It's now seven years later. I talked to Kate last month. Uh, she is essentially showing no evidence of her tumor. The drug she took was an experimental drug uh, called Iressa, and the reason it worked for her, it turns out, is because she has a specific mutation in her tumor, in her lung, the same one that spread to her brain, that creates a very powerful target for this particular drug. And that wasn't even known when she started the trial. And I have to tell you, many other people who took the drug did not get this same kind of benefit. It seemed like there was a real match here between an individualized amount of information about her cancer and this specific drug and how it works. Now that is an exciting scenario. You know, Kate said when she was first diagnosed, she wanted to find somebody who could give her hope. And so she looked around for people who had the same situation she did and who had lived for at least two years. And she couldn't find anybody. And she said to me last month, you know what? I became the person I was looking for. And now there's a lot of other people out there like me. Well, we have a ways to go to make so many other challenges like Kate's come true in the ways that hers has. But I tell you this story as an example of the way in which our molecular insight into the nature of disease is undergoing a revolutionary change. We have the tools now to be able, in a comprehensive fashion, to understand all of the ways in which a good cell goes bad. And that might be in cancer, it might be in heart disease, it might be in Alzheimer's disease. All of the things that normally keep a cell healthy, well, there are mechanisms there, and there are participants in that. There are players in that game. And with tools like genomics and nanotechnology and imaging and computational strategies, we are unraveling those mysteries at a prodigious rate. Uh, we can also take that new set of discoveries and speed up the process of translating those into therapeutics. And this is increasingly a circumstance where vigorous partnerships between academia and the private sector are both necessary and enormously exciting. And one of my goals as the new director of the NIH is to try to look at every possible way that we can speed up that process by empowering investigators who haven't really thought of themselves as doing translation to realize that they can be critical participants in that pipeline that leads you towards therapeutics like the one that has Kate Robbins now in such good shape. We also at NIH are looking carefully at ways that we could contribute to providing the kind of data that will make healthcare reform decisions as rational as possible. 
Because after all, we do want to know what to do to take that cost curve and try to bend it. And if medical research can give us better information about how to do so, we're all for that. And so we are spending a fair amount of our own efforts uh, trying to identify new directions to go uh, to try to improve the way in which we can inform that very critical national debate. So imagine, if you will, a time where we do have targeted therapeutics for most cancers that can be matched with the individual tumor, just as it was for Kate. Imagine a time where heart disease can be treated using stem cells to repair damaged heart muscle. Imagine a time where we have a vaccine for influenza that is universal. You take it once and it covers all of those strains that might develop in the future instead of our seasonal rush as we are now with H1N1 uh, trying to beat the, the race uh, to the uh, pandemic. Imagine that we could actually discover all of the causes of autism, the genetic factors, the environmental factors, and understand why this disease is growing in frequency in such a frightening way and understand what to do about it. Imagine, as you heard from Tony Fauci with this exciting news today, that we could stop the HIV pandemic, that this would be a scourge that people would write about instead of a scourge that's all around us. Imagine that we could come up with more effective treatments for malaria, perhaps even erasing that disease from the globe. Those are not pie in the sky ideas. There are scientists today who can see the pathway forward with those efforts and are working vigorously to make them come true. And boundaries between diseases are being broken down as a result. I loved what the Congress people said when they had a discussion about the idea that supporting disease in one area may actually benefit it in another. And that's a message I think that all people who are advocating for medical research uh, need to hear, that if you want to see a cure for cancer, well, you probably don't want to just focus on cancer research because the answers may come from somewhere else. And the more we understand the molecular basis of disease, the more we understand that our descriptions, our boundaries between diagnoses aren't all that rational when you really begin to understand what's going on. So the uniformity, the need for that kind of uh, integrative, cohesive approach uh, to understanding health and disease has never been more compelling on a scientific basis. And I would argue it also makes a better case if you're trying to support medical research to get all of the groups together and say, we need to do this in a comprehensive, uh, uniform, unanimous way and not end up in a circumstance where you have one disease battling against another for limited resources. So the opportunities are fantastic. And yet there are clouds on our horizon. And here we are in the Capitol Visitor Center. And of course, the thing that's on many people's minds that we've heard about today is will we find the support for this kind of medical research to enable it to go forward in this really turbocharged fashion that the science now makes possible? When you look at the statistics of how we're doing in terms of US leadership in medical research, it frankly is not encouraging if you see the way in which uh, the advances in research and development or the filing of patents or any other measure of innovation, uh, we have been steadily losing ground uh, comparing to some of our other colleagues in other places. And not to say that it's not wonderful that the rest of the world is making progress. They are and we should celebrate that. But we frankly by any measure have slipped back a bit. And some of that is on the basis of funding and some of it is on the fact that young people are increasingly not going into this field at the levels that we who are scientists who are having an incredible time working in this would think they would want to. If you look at undergraduates in the United States in science and engineering and you ask what proportion of them have their degrees in science and engineering compared to everything else that's out there, only 15 percent of American university graduates have their degree, their major in science and engineering, 15, one five percent. In China, that's over 50 percent. In Singapore, it's 65 percent. And you can see the consequences if you go to any laboratory today in the United States and look around and see who's there in the training uh, capacity, who are the up and coming next generation of scientists. And it's wonderful that we are in fact the place where many people come to get that training and it used to be then th they would stay in our country and work productively for their entire careers in medical research and we benefited hugely from that. But that is less true now. So where is our future generation if we can't come up with ways uh, to make it clear that science is an exhilarating opportunity? And that's why this Rock Stars of Science program has been, I think, such a wonderful idea to put forward an image 
uh, to people who are trying to decide at a uh, potentially vulnerable point in their career decision making, uh, an image of scientists as people who actually have a good time and who have a sense of humor, we hope, and uh, who can actually make music with Joe Perry. Oh my gosh, I never imagined that you could see that in a video, which you might in a few minutes. So we got to do a better job of that. We have to sort of uh, get a rid of the somewhat off-putting view of the scientist as a mysterious geek and put forward something that's more like what those of us who work in this field know to be the case. Uh, people who have passions, people who have dreams of what they might be able to do, people who play music, whatever. Finally, I think the thing that we are probably most uh, in this setting uh, concerned about, many of us, is what will be the support uh, for this marvelous engine of discovery called biomedical research. As you heard from earlier speakers, I think Congressman Markey mentioned, between 2003 and 2008, uh, the, the purchasing power for biomedical research at NIH fell by 16% because of flat budgets and inflationary erosion in the, what you could buy with that in terms of training and equipment and so on. We have right now a wonderful moment with the $10 billion that have been given to NIH as part of the stimulus package. And I think actually very justifiable in terms of the way in which that money is both stimulating research and benefiting the economy. And the outpouring of ideas that's come forward from that, which I've spent a lot of time in my first six weeks looking at, is incredible. We thought we might get, you know, three or four thousand responses to a new program called Challenge Grants. We got 21,000 responses. And sadly, even with this wonderful stimulus package, we're only able to fund about three percent of them. In general, uh, for all of our grants programs, we are unable to fund more than about one out of five. Now the big question on everybody's minds is, what is going to happen when the stimulus package, which is a two-year funding effort, is basically over? Science doesn't operate on two-year cycles. It's not a hundred-yard dash, it's a marathon. When that two years come to an end, which is fiscal year 11, if in fact uh, the support for biomedical research falls back to where it had been uh, before this, then our success rates will drop to something like one in 10. We've done that modeling. That would be historically the lowest ever. And just at the point where we see this marvelous opportunity uh, to see medical research go forward at a prodigious rate, that would be truly uh, a tragic outcome. We can make a great case, people, about medical research, how it improves human health. We can talk about how heart disease has fallen by 63% in the last 30 years. We can talk about how a recent analysis of the support for biomedical research just based on its impact on human health and the economy says that we should be putting four times as much into it as we currently do. We can talk about how disability rates have fallen 30% since 1982 on the basis of medical research. We can talk about cochlear implants or Herceptin for breast cancer or Haemophilus influenzae type B vaccinations that have saved 5,000 kids from meningitis and mental retardation. We can tell all those stories. And we should, but I think we can't be shy about it. And I think again, perhaps in a country where as you heard early this morning, most people can't name a single living scientist and most of them don't know what NIH stands for, we've got a ways to go. And so remember Kate Robbins, think about Kate and her seven year course as where we could go and where we need to go and where we must go for Alzheimer's disease, for heart disease, for diabetes, all those conditions that take lives away and shorten the opportunity of so many people to experience the fullness of the life that we all hope for. We can go there, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work. We, the scientific community, I think are revved up and ready to go, especially this afternoon, but we need the kind of networking of support uh, that we can only achieve if we're effective in working together. So just like a rock band, you got to have a lead guitarist, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, Joe Perry is the one uh, for our band, but it takes the whole band to make music. You all are the band, so let's see if this little rehearsal we're having this afternoon can lead us to go on tour. Thank you very much.